This episode of Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico is sponsored by Notch Brewing, located in Salem, Massachusetts, brewing and serving European-influenced beer in their beer hall and beer garden on the beautiful Salem Harbor. Notch is in the process of putting the finishing touches on their second and new location at 525 Western Avenue in Brighton, Mass., just minutes from downtown Boston. The new Notch location will also have a beer hall, a large beer garden, and an outdoor live performance and music space, which will be hosting shows in July and August. Now, not only do you get some of the finest brews around, you can also enjoy live music while you're drinking that beautiful brew. Notch's Beer is available throughout Mass and Rhode Island, and also through mail order, from Mass and PA. If you haven't tried Notch yet, it's time you do. Get yourself a Notch beer, or better yet, head over to Notch Brewing and tell them Twisted Rico sent you. Blowing smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. So how's everybody doing out there? It's good to see that things are finally opening up again. Tours are being booked left and right. It's going to be one hell of a summer. And then the fall, forget about it, as they say down in New York. There's going to be shows going on everywhere. It seems like every other day there's a new tour being announced. You know, I get a lot of messages from people, which I greatly appreciate, and want to remind you that you can go back and listen to every stinking episode of this podcast on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. As long as we keep making them, please keep listening, because we're not going to stop making them. Um, I've been getting a fantastic response on the new music segment, and I'm definitely going to keep doing that. In fact, today I just want to acknowledge some of the bands that are going to be playing shows again that we really like across America and Europe and everywhere. Bands like Field Day, Beach Bunny, The Darts, Death Valley Girls, Los Lobos. That's right, Los Lobos is going to be playing a show in Indian Ranch in Webster, Mass., I'm going to get tickets for that because I've never seen Los Lobos, and I've always wanted to see them. And my other good friends from Denver, Colorado, Milk Toast and Company are going on tour. believe they're going to be in the Boston area as well. There's also some pretty big stadium tours, and the one I wanted to tell you about that I heard about is called, I'm not sure I like the name, but it's called the Hella Mega Tour. It's with Green Day, Fall Out Boy, Weezer, and the Interrupters. And I heard just a little while ago that that show is going to be at Fenway Park in Boston, right across the river from where we are. The stadium tour with Motley Crue, Poison, Def Leppard, and Joan Jett, unfortunately, has been moved to 2022, which is kind of weird that some stadium tours are happening and some are not. I was looking forward to seeing that. I'm just hoping that everyone stays healthy out there and, you know, we don't go back to where we were because I never want to go back to that disease called 2020 ever again. I don't want to deal with any of that. So today, I'm going to play you a phone interview that we recorded with someone I have a great deal of respect and admiration for, and he's also a great friend of mine, Troy Gregory, Detroit's own Troy Gregory. Troy has played in so many bands and probably has played on as many records as anyone I've ever personally known in the music industry. His journey began when he left Detroit to go to L.A. and soon ended up in the Phoenix-based thrash band Flotsam and Jetsam, who he made two records with when they were signed to MCA Records. And he later joined Prong, really great band. I also know Tommy Victor very well, and I have a lot of respect for Prong. He was on the Prove You Wrong record. He made a very heavy contribution on that record. Not only as the bass player of the band, but he co-wrote several of the songs 
From there, he played with the Swans on their Love of Life record and then spent years with the Dirt Bombs, who are regarded as one of the best live bands in America. He played on four of their albums and still occasionally. And from what he told me in the interview that I really liked, he still considers himself a member of the band, which is awesome. He also had his own band, The Witches, which is like a Detroit all-star band. They have five records out. And he's done a ton of solo records, like eight. I mean, it's impossible to cover. It was impossible to cover everything in one interview, but I tried. A famous Detroit producer and also a friend of mine, Jim Diamond, once told me that Troy is the best musician he knew. The best. It's like a tremendous compliment coming from a guy who's worked with many, many bands, produced hundreds of bands, and helped the White Stripes to find their sound early on, recording their first two albums for them. So coming from Jim Diamond, that is an amazing compliment. Before we play the interview with Troy, we got a track for him, which is kind of an exclusive. He took it off the Zavera album. Xaviera, I can never say that name right, but I'm going to keep practicing. We joke about that during the interview. This song is called I Want to Thank the Academy. Like I said, it's an exclusive for us. So enjoy this track, and then we'll play the Troy interview.
All right. Please welcome, finally, to the Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico podcast, my good friend, Troy Gregory. How are you, man? I'm doing well. Thank you. Yourself? Very good. (laughs) It sounds like we haven't talked to each other in in ages, but we just talked to each other last night. (laughs) Yes, we did. So uh, there's so much... Be a flashlight on the roof. So I just played Xaviera. I want to thank the Academy, which I think is probably the first time anyone's ever heard this excerpt from the double album. Am I correct in saying that, Troy? Yes. Yes. Actually, that version's different from the record. Uh, I guess if it was uh, to be professional, I should call it it's the single edit or radio edit or whatever kind of goofy name I can come up with, what kind of edit it is. We'll call it the podcast edit. Sure enough. <laughs> so I'm going to hit you with some Detroit stuff to start the thing off because you grew up in Detroit, which to me is one of the greatest music cities in the United States. I put Boston up there with Detroit and then, you know, you got LA and New York and Chicago, but Detroit is so great. What was it like growing up there and how did the music in Detroit influence you? Uh, well, the thing is, well, obvious, the obvious one is Bowtown. You know, especially when I was born, um, I think the Supremes themselves had like uh, eight of the top ten, um, you know, songs at the time. So that was stuff that my parents always played the radio, you know, so that in the Detroit radio chorus, you know, celebrated that. So it got played quite a bit in a way. Um, also knowing that there was people, you know, you know where the, um, you got pointed out by my, my, my dad, you know, oh, the Supremes lived here, you know, and you'd see heads fell. So it all seemed local. So I was really kind of, when I got a little older, like surprised that it was a global thing. I really did think it was just kind of a regional in a way. I mean, this is when I was super, super young. So you kind of were aware of that, but then finding out that it was just so big, you're like, oh, well, these are people in the neighborhood. You know, um, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's just has that, uh, I, 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 know, I, I don't want to romanticize it or anything like that. It's, it's just, it was there all the time. Right. Did you, know you ever I mean? actually go, you probably went by that Motown location a lot when you're. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you yeah, know, it's like, it's all here. I mean, there was, and there was a lot of led to Motown musicians still around town too, you know? And um, so, you know, it was something that you didn't play with or anything. You know? So it's a, uh, it was, you know, but it, 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 I wouldn't like that Detroit mythology. People from Detroit, especially if they're abroad, and especially if someone thinks, oh, you know, you came from some dangerous place, as if that's going to make your music that much more um, relevant. <laughs> and of course, they don't want to um, dispel that, that, that thing and they'll keep it up. Yeah. You know, that's one thing I don't like, though. You know, like those shirts, like, and have like a gun on it, and like, welcome to Detroit or some that, you know. So it's, you know, people, I don't like people trying to keep this. Uh, I just think it's silly. It's childish, you know what I mean? Um, there's I just like so it. much about Detroit that's really beautiful and, you know, wonderful architecture. And what's great here is, it's, you know, in any direction you kind of can go, you can um, change your backdrop, you know. I mean, there's the Warren Dunes, uh, you, you know, and so you can experience a desert kind of area then you had all the uh you know a lot of you know, woods you know for and stuff and then, then you get the, the of course the lakes and it's just you know so it's the idea that it's just some gritty place and stuff like that it's you know it's a uh, I don't see it. I mean, yes, of course that is there, but you find that in every place. Yeah, you, so, when you know I, I mean? when I stayed in Detroit, I used, I stayed at your house once, but in a couple other people's houses in Ypsilanti, Ypsilanti and places, but mostly I stayed in hotels downtown because I usually mm-hmm. was there to go to ghetto with Jim uh, Diamond. And uh, it's, you know, I wanted to do something kind of funny with you. You started with the Supremes. I wanted, I, I've i never done this before, but I feel like I can do it with you. When I say this artist's name, give me one sentence about them. Oh. Are you ready? Okay. Bob sure. Seeger. Bob Seeger. Uh, one sentence about Seeger. Um, his, his, uh, I like his... Um, his, his newer music that he was doing, and I'm saying newer, like his 70s stuff, of course, this is more one sentence. His new music doesn't have the same soul. I like his old, old, old kind of rock and Bob roll. Seger system, right? Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's other things. I don't just, that's it. But it, the thing is, you kind of got, you grew up with him shoved down your throat, too, you know. I did have the Night Moves record, though, and uh, 
fifth grade. So yeah, I know it's going to be hard to keep you to one set. So I'm going to try. Sorry, Alice. My friend. Yeah, bad, bad I mean, I did one season. Yeah. So. Ready? Alice Ready. Cooper. Alice Cooper. Hello, hooray. I still use sometimes as a wake up alarm. Nice. And, um, yeah. Uh, I met Alice once and awkwardly asked him where he hung out in Detroit and I mentioned some weird old mall, Northland Mall. It's very nice, though. How about Smokey Robinson? Smokey, one of the best, greatest songwriters around, actually. You know, obviously. Uh, oh, I hate the sound of Bob Cat doing one of the best, one of the great. Um, uh, Smokey, I mean, just uh, synonymous with Detroit, really. Well, you know, it's staying in that vein, Otis Williams? Slash- Otis, yeah, same, same deal. You know, uh, just again, the kind of these names are just kind of synonymous with Detroit in the same way of like even like sport people from here or actors, you know. Or, Don't worry, I'm not going to ask about Mickey Lola or Al Kaline or anybody like that. For people out well, there, funny, I, go ahead. Sorry, I, I show my I show my age when it comes to sports because I know nothing about sports. But I start saying uh, Detroit Tigers members, people get on their like, oh my god, like what what year did you actually watch baseball? And I was like, never, but I remember Mark Vidrich, the bird. Oh yeah, football. he's you know he's from Massachusetts. You know he grew up out oh, here. Man. Yeah, he's from Central yeah. Mass. The birds from uh, Northborough, Mass, Massachusetts. So you picked a good one for people yeah. that are listening and wondering if what these people have in common. They're all from Detroit. So um, I'm going to skip a couple and I'm going to go ahead to Rare Earth. Rare Earth. Don't know much about Rare Earth except that they're covers. You know, um, you know. I just I am. And I only kind of knew that, that was because when I was a kid, I really got in a kiss. And there was this poster of an old kiss thing. And it's a special guest, Rare Earth. What about? So I, I, okay, I go ahead. I didn't really know. No, I just was not really familiar with Rare Earth, to tell you the truth. Okay, I'm glad you're honest. Uh, Iggy Pop? Um, obviously, one of my favorites. I think his best lyrics were, were about, even though it's not one of his greatest records, but Zombie Birdhouse, uh, that the lyrics to that record should have could have been put out as a book of poetry. Wow. He kind of lost it after that. I mean, after that he kind of started writing kind of more like a, I don't know, if he was trying to get in with the whole Guns N' Roses LA gun thing that was popular at the time when he you know, he kind of did this kind of change where his lyrics a friend of mine pointed out like that American Caesar and he didn't want to throw him to the lions from the lions. He goes, That was near all you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, oh, ja- what about fantastic. Jack Oops, sorry. What about Jack Twice. White? Jack, uh I don't know, just happy for the guy. You know, he was a number like the them around playing people laughing at them on stage in Detroit, you know, and we just played uh Dirt Bombs played about two years ago his um, anniversary thing at the Third Man, and uh, you know he's just you know quite gracious to us. They don't have a little party at his house, which was like freaking out of uh, us. We're going to see the Spruce Goose in the back. Was that and, Memphis? Uh, the, uh, Nashville. Nashville. Yeah. Nashville. Yeah, I had a nice little party after with all all the bands there, his bar and a bowling alley in his house, and. Um, and, you know, he's just talking to them exactly like it's like talking with them at the Gold Dollar when, you know, they were when they were opening for like, you know, something like the Gold or Bantam Rooster. Nice. OK, uh, just a few more. Uh, Rodriguez. Mm-hmm. Rodriguez is uh, I just was hanging out with him the other day. I'm going to see him in about a week. Um, he's putting on a little um, backyard show. He's having me play and he had me come over and wanted to hear my new songs. I was playing for him and uh He's just a good guy. I've just been so I've played how with old him is he, Troy, about? a bunch of times. Oh, I don't know. God, late seventies, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say. I was going to say. Um, yeah, some, somewhere like that. But he's he's a straight up guy. I played. Um, I did one time. He asked me to play one set with him. This place in Miami and Detroit. And it turned out to be three sets <laughs> and stuff. But that. But then after he kind of that success with the, the films, I played with him in Ann Arbor. Uh, Blues Folk Festival, which actually was hosted by Colin Hay, from, you know, Metal Works. Oh yeah, yeah, wow, and uh, and stuff. But um, and but you know, Rodriguez, you know, he just he gave me a little bit more than I expected, and you know, and he said, well, you know, he remembered that three set thing that I did, and you know, so you know, I love that doc- guy. I love the documentary. Uh, just two more, Jim Diamond. Yeah. Jim Diamond. Have not talked to Jim in a long time. 
recorded so many records at his studio. So many recordings, whether it was my own or someone else's I played with. He played in The Witches for a while, too. Um, I haven't seen him a while. I'd like to talk to him, talk with him, you know. Um, but I don't keep in contact with people very well. And so he's doing good. His name will come up again. Uh, one more, Matt Smith. Matt Smith. I met Matt on my friend Michael Lonzo's porch. Because uh, uh, Matt was a couple grades ahead. He was in my brother's grade. And so was Mike. And Mike, I, I don't know, she just said Mike plays drums for Flogging Molly now. He's being a Flogging Molly. Fed, Fed Rooster, Meanies, uh, Speedball. Um, but yeah, but Mike, uh, we were sitting on his porch and we were listening to the 8-track of Black Sabbath. We sold his soul for rock and roll. I was probably about in sixth grade and those guys were like an eighth. Or, and Matt showed up um, and he had under his arm Trout Mass Replica. West Bruce and Lang and Rainbow live on stage. And he, and, and that uh, was when you were in the eighth grade? Uh, they were in eighth. I was in about six. Wow. That's and uh, <laughs> so Matt was like, they had, because he was the only child, had um, tons of records and stuff. His mom and his mom were still quite poor living in this little apartment, but it was, he had so, so many records. So he was the one actually kind of was supposed to be like, yeah, to like Captain Beefheart. And stuff I'm like a that, huge. That, yeah, I'm a huge Outrageous Cherry fan, so I had to ask about them. So um, Yeah, man, we've done so many projects together, me and Matt, I mean, through the years, you know, it's, uh, it's but uh, you yeah, haven't talked to him a lot. Another person I should give you, a ring to. You actually introduced me to Matt one time when I was out there at a super birthday show, and I'll never forget that because I was, like, nervous. I get nervous about certain people. When I was friends with Kim Foley, rest in peace, and we talked on the phone a lot, he talked about Matt Smith all the time. He loved Matt Smith. He loved Troy Gregory. He Ooh. loved Jim Diamond. He loved all you Detroit guys, Eugene Strobe. He was really into the Detroit guys, and he kind of got me more excited about Detroit. I ended up managing a Detroit band, the Gorgor Girls, uh, right, soon right. thereafter. Okay, so let's go way back. What made you move to L.A., and why did you make that move? I'm thinking you wanted to go out there to be a rock star, but tell us about that. When did that happen, and what made you do it? Never, you know, it's funny. I never really wanted to be a rock star so much you know what i mean when i was really young it's like you wanted to be like kind of like the saturday morning cartoon things i figured i'd have some friends you, you know and uh animal that talks and we you know you go solve mysteries and then you play play in a band or you like the monkeys who live on the beach you know that type of thing i saw it like that you know what i mean it was never to like oh, i'm gonna make girls or i'm gonna make money or anything like that it was uh, n never really so the la thing though was um because of the music school out there, Musicians Institute, I was debating on going either there or Berkeley. And after I graduated, I took some classes at the community college. I was doing drafting, which I hated, which my father was a craftsman. So I was able to get work doing it. And um, But the thing is, and I was playing in a band, and we we're playing around in Detroit. And this thing's like I rented out a four-track for us, and uh, the guitar player disappeared for the weekend. And just like... Uh, I was always trying to write original songs and um, I always kind of got, well, who'd want to hear a song that you wrote? You know I mean? It was always really, I had these friends that if anything did not ever want you to kind of move out of your, the comfort zone of what they think you are or who you are. And uh, so this band and the people I hung out with just kind of had this falling out with, it was all like, um, you know, you're, you're, you're too ambitious, you know, that type of deal. Whereas this, I just was out of school already for about a year and a half and things were just, you know, I thought I was doing stuff with the band and just relying on other people. And I said, like, fuck this. I, and then it was like, I wanted to go to the school there and, and mostly because while well, I was heavily more just in the bass before I started really kind of getting other instruments and Jeff Berlin was there. He had the wrecking crew people there, Tommy Tedesco, Paul Roberts, um, Joe Pats, you know, worked with uh, Billy Holiday and Charlie Parker was there. You know, so it, it was just to go to the, it was go to the Musicians Institute. And I'd never been to California. That was my very first time going there and didn't know anyone. And before I left, though, I did get that whole, oh, you went out there to be a wrestler. And I'd, oh, I'd get the, oh, do you know the competition out there? And, or do you know the suicide rate? And then and this stuff and the delusion and blah, 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 blah. blah. Well, your life, really... your life would have been completely different if you would have picked the Berkeley School of Music in Boston instead of L.A. You might have been in like, you know, 
I mean, I yeah. know when you, it didn't take very long before you got out there that you started auditioning. Now, I know you auditioned for a very famous band, but you didn't get that part and you ended up in another band. Why don't you tell the whole story about Flotsam and Jetsam and how you ended up in them? They were oh. signed to MCA Records, so you ended up on a major label pretty fast. They were on Electra first because it was like, well, that was, you know, I went to the school. And weird little things happen, like, at the school. Like, I didn't actually go out to seek auditions or nothing. It really, my whole intention, 100%, was to go to the school. I didn't even know how you got auditions or anything like that, you know? And um, right almost the first week I moved there, there was a guitar show. And I sat, I was picked up a bass and started playing it. And this guy says, and, you know, I'm a kid, so I'm showing off. And the, um, the guy there has told me, hey, if you stay at this booth and play, I'll give you a free set of strings. So I'm sitting there playing, and I look up, and um, Rudy Sarzo is standing above me. <laughs> and, and, and he's like, how old are you? And um, hey, I looked like I was 15. And then he gave me his number, and he said he was trying to find me a band to be in. I talked to him a couple times on the phone. Nothing really materialized, because all of a sudden he got really busy. He's like, oh, I just, I just joined Whitesnake, you know, that type of thing. But that was really kind of him, you know, to try to help out a kid like that. That Metallica thing. Though that was a guy I knew had the audition. I didn't, like I said, I never even thought about having an audition. And he wanted my help to help him learn the audition songs. And then I just drove with him to San Francisco so he had someone to drive with. And then I just ended up going to the audition itself where he was like, oh, you don't go. I'm like, I don't even have a bass. And I did. not And so, um, and the guy at the studio had, had one. So, uh, a guy I started talking to, some biker guy. And so he's, oh, you can audition. And they were going to send everyone away. They're like, oh, one other person. So I ended up actually doing it. And then they called me back and we played more. They kept on asking me how old I was and let me see your ID. And I didn't drink at the time. They thought that was odd and everything. But I jammed with them the whole day and then talked with Lars. And then he, I didn't have a phone, so he gave me his number. So I'd call him from a pay phone when I got back to L.A. And I didn't bring the records with me when I moved to L.A., so I had to go to Electra, and they had for me some uh, cassettes. I got my cassette, um, so I could learn some more of the songs. But then, you know, it's like, oh, we're going with this guy, Jason Newsett from Flotsam and Jetsam. And I knew that name only because I met, and this is funny, because it was Jason Newsted and this other guy, uh, Phil Dirt. I met them on the, on the strip, like, about a year before that, because they were doing something. They were handing out Flotsam and Jetsam stickers. And I just knew the name from a Peter Gabriel song. I didn't actually know what lots of just meant at the time. It was kind of ridiculous. And I, so I had that sticker. So I knew the name, but I had no idea what they sounded like. And then there was this drummer, Chuck Beeler, who started playing with Megadeth, who in Detroit, I filled in on bass for a band that he was in twice. And um, just ran into him on the, on the street. I was going to his comic book shop. And he was like, well, I remember him. I saw this, kind of remembering us stupidly. But there was a studio music grinder right on Melrose, and I thought I saw Dave Mustaine, so I thought, oh, Chuck's there, so I'm going to go just say hi to Chuck. And so then um, then Chuck, uh, we could talk to him, and then I was working at the library at Musicians Institute. And today I got fired. A lot of my roommates um, says to me, um, yeah, Chuck Beeler called, and said, give him a call, and it's about this band. They say he said, Flossie and Chester's like for bass player. They had the same management, this guy, um, Keith something. And they were... Um, going to be torn together in Europe and, you know, we want to join. So, you know, when you just lost your job and someone says, hey, there's a band, they want you and they're going to be going to Europe. I was like, cool. I really not heard them at all. Well, wow, that's, if I, could, if I can interrupt you for a second, that's weird because I always thought that you tried out for Metallica and you didn't get it and Jason Newstead had something to do with you getting in Flotsam, oh, not, but he did Not it. at all. Wow. Nothing at all. I barely know that guy. I've met him like twice. We went over his house once with lots more in tour. Let me play as a Lembic, which I can't afford. <laughs> and, um, but no, no, he had nothing at all to do with it. And actually, the Metallica thing happened the, the first two months I was going to school. So, I mean, it wasn't heartbroken or anything. I didn't, you know, I mean, I, I was just starting to go to school, which was, I was excited about. I immersed myself in completely. So they, um, and so the Fossum thing wasn't until, oh, that was a whole other year later. Wow, that, I didn't too. realize that. They, you, so they you, had a guy, Mike Spencer, on bass that they got, and so I actually kind of replaced him. Oh, okay. I'm sorry I got that a little mixed up there. So oh, you, no, no. It's, you did record two records with Flotsam, though. 
Yeah, they, were the, they had the one that was already written, No Place for Disgrace. I think I added a couple little things, but um, and I didn't get too heavily involved with it and stuff. But then, um, yeah, and they were on Electra. And we, you know, we toured into some of that. Then they got dropped from Electra and uh, eventually picked up by MCA. But for a while, there, I was living in their rehearsal place. I mean, they're all from there, so they all had family or girlfriends or, you know, buddies. I didn't know anyone, so I, 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 just, I lived on the, the, the floor, <coughs> excuse me, in the rehearsal room, you know, and stuff for, for a little bit, you know, just all different. I lived in every little area of freaking around the Phoenix metro area. So you didn't get a house? Mesa, Tem- so, Tempe. So, yeah, so you never got a house from like MCA Records or anything to live in then. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, I mean, you, you had your, your rent paid for, for a modest, modest place, which was nice. That's the one perk you know this record companies like that work like loan sharks in a way um and you know it's, so you it, 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 kind of living, but you're nothing to save you left la and moved to phoenix because flotsam yeah i had yeah well yeah obviously, yeah obviously i had to you know they uh um yeah i would so i just say I, I was there then for a couple of years and so i lived in every little area there i've i I realized I've lived in 36 different places. <laughs> wow. I might be able to rival that, but we'll do that another time. <laughs> so yeah. after you were in Flotsam for a while, did you meet Tommy Victor from Prong while you were in Flotsam? Is that how you ended up when you left Flotsam getting into Prong? Or did you have to audition for that as well? No, we... Um Lots of when they did their when the storm comes down tour, we had a list of bands to pick to open, and so I picked Prong. Wow! And and then, and I and Prong, I was just because I read an article one about them and I heard that there was like a little bit of killing joke in them, and I knew that Ted Parsons was in Swans, so um, you know, and they just came out with Beg to Differ, so we they they were the opening act on a good almost two months tour. And I mostly hung out with Mike Kirkland, the bass player who they had me replace. Um, Mike's who I hung out with almost the most on that tour. And I ended up riding with Prong a lot. Lots of times I'd ride in their van with them. And uh, just kind of got along. With them. But uh, I, it was about still even about a good year after that or so that I think I actually uh, joined them that I got a call. I got a call from Tommy. I was back living in Detroit. I already quit Blossom. I moved back to LA for a while. Then I went with my girlfriend at the time to Portland and that didn't happen. So I came back to Michigan and I was working Nashville with Matt Smith again. Um, me and Matt Smith started basically what would eventually become the witches. Cause I was only in Prong a year and a half. Too. But you were and, on the uh, Pro- Prove You Wrong record, which was like a fantastic yeah. record. And I was just refreshing my memory last night. You wrote, you co-wrote a lot of the songs on that record with Tommy. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was a lot of stuff that they had written, but then there were some some things they wrote with Mike, and they wanted some newer things. So I had a couple things. I started with Matt Smith. This one piece that ended up being a song called "Hell If I Could" on uh, Prove You Wrong was something I actually started with Matt. Um, and I just kind of brought in. So yeah, I got I did some some of the writing and uh, some of the vocal stuff because Mike would sing sometimes too. Except um, you know it's more you know the, the, the kind of scream, yeah, and everything and everything uh, for the voice. But like it was, uh, yeah, that was uh, a while after uh, after Flotsam. I was it's funny because I read the thing of like quit Flotsam and join Prong. Like it was like this decision. And it's weird because I don't really have much of a plan. You know what I mean? It's like you're saying, like, like for L.A. and for Blossom and for Prong, all these things just kind of fell in and kind of happened. They definitely weren't things I was seeking. You know what I mean? And right. stuff. It was just doing just doing my thing. And the funny thing is, is I can kind of kick myself because around that same time when Tommy asked me to join, I was working on songs that would eventually become The Witches. Uh I got a little call from MCA, uh, Three Cents, and uh, the, you know, the, who's an awesome person, said they were keeping me on as a solo artist, and if I needed money for demos or anything like that, but I was so insecure about being on my own, you know, I took Tommy's offer. And then another wow. weird thing I found out from Kim Thale and Chris Cornell told me that they were going to ask me to join Soundgarden after they, after they uh, got rid of Jason, um, but then they found out I joined Prong two weeks before. 
Timing, man. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Timing, timing is a funny thing. So, uh, what yeah. happened with Prong? Because you only was you stayed with them for one record, and then did you just? I mean, you mentioned earlier that you like to take chances and do different kinds of things. Is that what happened with Prong? Because they were pretty one dimensional. Um, actually, um, I thought that Prong had a little more depth in a lot of a lot of ways, so that that wasn't always apparent. Maybe. Um, and I think oh, I, I liked the band and I liked them. New York was just kind of like, again, like Phoenix, again, a place where I didn't really know anyone. I stayed all over the place. I mean, I was on, I was in Ridgewood. I was in Williamsburg. I was in Carroll Gardens. And then I was like in the city. I'm down in about South Houston, you know, down there on Ludlow Street and I'm 14th Street. Then I'm on 144th Street. You know, it's I was boxed around everywhere because, you know, it's hard to find jobs, too, if you're going on tour in a couple of weeks and it's so sporadic. So, um, and so I spent most of my time at the bar, the coffee shop, or taking walks. And uh, the last prong tour, we over toured that record. We did a tour that just didn't go well. And me and Tommy butted heads on it. I mean, we're, we're fine now, but we did. And then I was, I was writing this, like, and stuff that became more like the witch, that became the witches. And I was writing things that weren't set in a very um, um, angry, for lack of a better word. Uh, no, that's not right, right, because some of the shit I was doing with that. I don't know. I just wanted a different feel that was more than, like, and every song's got that distorted guitar or uh, angry. And I was just writing this other stuff that I knew that they couldn't do when I'd bring in songs. I'm like, oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. And then because we butted had so much of that last tour and I was just drinking so much I'm living off of the street food, just not taking care of myself. You know, people thought I was on actual drugs, you know, which I never got into really. And so I just, every time I came back home to visit my parents, I'd get together with Matt Smith and we'd go down to Detroit and there was something about the cast quarter scene. I'm like, just, just felt vibrant. I wanted that. So that's why I left wrong. And I even told them I'm leaving at the end of the store. They, until I actually did it, they're like, "Oh shit, you really did!" You know, so, caused some problems. You know, them, so, but, you know, I was I, I I counted, and I could be wrong that you play on at least thirty two albums, <laughs> according to Wikipedia, and that's pre Super Birthday, which was a band that you had going for a few years. But where did the Swans fit into this? Because I thought after Prong, oh. you were in the Swans, and you played on their yeah. Love of Life album. That was during while well, I was in Prong. Um, oh, okay. Because Mike, Michael, Michael Girard, um used to drink at this bar that I drank at, uh, Horseshoe Bar 7B. Oh, and, yeah, I know that uh, place. I know that place. Yeah. So I would talk to him various times. And um, actually, my, Matt Smith was somehow got in touch with him. And Matt was supposed to play in the Swans thing. But the recording he gave Mike had me playing bass on it. Mike, Matt was playing guitar. And he was, so when he found out it was me, he asked if I would play. So he had me and Ted went to Martin BC studio in, in Brooklyn. And we just recorded three songs. I paid a hundred bucks a song. And uh, that was it. It was just for a day. Oh, so you never studio. toured or played any live shows with the Swans? No. Oh, no, just, okay. Just one record. It's kind of like, you know, we were saying about all the records. It's funny because I looked at Wikipedia thing and they're short, tons of records, tons of singles, too, tons <laughs> of things. There's no mention either of any film soundtrack stuff I've done or anything like that. It's pretty incomplete. Just to complain for a second here. Oh, that's but, um, okay. I mean, I think 32 albums is pretty impressive if there's more than but, that. Uh, I mean... <laughs> but, yeah, it's... Uh, but, wait, 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 what was your question? I trailed off there for a second. Uh, although you answered it. I thought that you actually joined the Swans as a member. No, but, oh, this, yeah. yeah, this is what I want to say. It's kind of like also I, hear, I see things like he played with Spiritualized. The thing with Spiritualized was Dirt Bonds, we were in England, we were friends with Jason Pierce, and Jason would come to the shows, and he was working on his record, the A&E album, and had uh, me, Mick, and Poe just come and do backing vocals on it, and we just hung out all day, played us his stuff. You're it's talking so funny about thing, Mick and Co- thought, Yeah, you're talking about Mick and uh, Co Molina from the Dirt Bombs. Right, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so it was. So it's kind of funny to go. Oh, he was in spiritualized. <laughs> All I did was just sing backing vocals on one song one afternoon. I didn't know if that was on the list of records on Wikipedia. Maybe it is. I don't have well, that in I mean, front was, of me. It was a job, you know. So, and well, I liked Jason. So, 
Yeah, but one thing I did notice and counted is that there were five Witches albums and four Dirt Bombs albums. I want to talk about the Dirt Bombs for a minute before we talk about the Witches because at one time, I remember Spin Magazine had the top ten live bands in the world, and it was an outrageous list. It was like the E Street Band, Green Day, you know, all these bands, and then the Dirt Bombs were on that list. And I believe yeah. you were in the band at the time that that came out, because when I saw the Dirt Bombs live, I would agree it was probably one of the best live bands that I'd ever seen. It was the two bass, two drum setup that you guys had going that really blew me away. I saw you guys in Phoenix, and I saw you one oh, other right. time. Um, yeah, that was that, probably the best show I ever played was with them in, in Barcelona. Um, Barcelona? Barcelona. Yeah, we drove like 18 hours from um, the previous gig, I think it was in Croatia, to, uh, to well, however long it took us there. And we wanted to get to the festival a day earlier because Iggy and the Stooges were playing it and everything. And uh, it was funny because I never tell my brother about this festival. I'm like, oh, the festival, it's got Iggy and the Stooges are playing, um, Psychic TV, uh, Echo and the Bunnymen. Even the uh, new order, my brother goes, what the fuck are you turning in a time machine? <laughs> and so, but... Um, Yes, but yeah, Dirt Bombs, I left the band four times and joined five. I, you know, I, I'm not I, even sure. Are you still in the Dirt Bombs or not? Yes, I'm, I, yeah, I'm, ba- I'm back in. I joined <laughs> back in when they when we played the Metallica Orion Festival thing. Um, Nick, I told Nick I wanted back in, so he got me back in. So well, the, just, lineup, I, yeah, the lineup I saw was just absolutely fantastic. I thought you and... Uh, Co, like you, you replaced Jim Diamond in the Dirt Bombs, pretty much, right? Well, first uh, a couple times, me and him were in the band at the same time. Wow. I played fuzz too for 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 them too, and then so sometimes we were at the same time. Then it was me and Co, then sometimes it was Co and Jim. <laughs> it was interesting because I was in so many other bands. I was still doing the Witches. I was doing the Subsisters. I was playing with the Band of Mare. Uh, I was doing the Soul stuff. So it's like just something got busy and they had a tour, right, and I couldn't do it. You know, they you know someone else would do it, but uh, I did a probably the long. I guess I'm in the longest lineup of the of the Dirt Bombs, and it's that lineup again. But we, yeah, everyone's scattered around the globe. Patrick's in Australia, and um, Nick's in New York, and Ben's in Nashville. Co's the only one here; it's still in Detroit. Co Molina, <laughs> but actually, I just did a recording with with uh, Mick. Uh, Via the electronic mail, um, we did a cover of uh, "Fish Ain't Biting" from um, oh God, um, Detroit guy. What's right today? I can't figure. What is the cover we did? I'm, I don't know what that's ever gonna get. The fish ain't biting. What the heck? I well, can't remember. Who. I'm actually glad that you you're still. Oh, Lamont the- Dozier wrote it. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, Dr. Lamont. I'm, I'm I'm happy that you're st- you know still or back in the dirt bombs because I always talk about how to me they're like the greatest garage rock band in America and I sincerely mean that and the funny thing about it and I'm looking this up so I'll get the name right you guys put a record out in 2008 called We Have You Surrounded it's one yeah. of the best amazing most overlooked records I swear ever that, like that record's record. brilliant like man at cna it, it's yeah I, I, go ahead i'm sorry I keep on interrupting you we're talking about you sorry go ahead that's all right i wish you were in the room with me i can't stand doing phone interviews but you know that's the you're in detroit i'm in boston but you know that record i feel like listening to your solo stuff the more recent stuff even i feel like you probably had a little bit of an impact on that record did you have a lot to do with that record I well I, 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 enough, but like enough that I was happy with it, you know. But it's definitely mixing. It's funny because we did a split record once with King Khan and the Shrines, and I did some of the writing on that. But Mick really wanted to do something kind of almost like uh, Red Crayola or um, you know really Hawkwind or something, and um, so we. And uh, we put that out, and it got all the horrible reviews, especially from like garage rock punk uh, things. They're of like, course, this is horrible, and they blamed me. And they're like, "This is because that Troy Gregory guy is on it." Yeah, <laughs> it, it was a pretty. So it's and, a and Mick was 
Mick was so upset that he didn't get the blame for it because it was his intention <laughs> that he then that, that he was like I can I, just, I don't know if I can always have you writing because everyone's always gonna think that you know yeah I, I remember was, I want, he I, wanted to blame I remember talking to the guy who thinks he's like the king of garage rock you know I'm talking about that guy in New York that has that radio network and he told me oh that record's horrible you know and I'm thinking what is he talking about this record's brilliant. Just because it's not fitting into the garage rock format, does it? It was, yeah, it was more progressive. I mean, you know. Yeah, I mean, if Mick had his way, his record would probably sound somewhere between STC and and you know, Phil Akuti or something. It, uh, but then again, you know, things change. I mean, he's just good, really fun to work with. I mean, we room together, so we're good friends. Um, very similar. We both kind of grew up very. Um, you know, just the kid that stayed in his room didn't have a lot of friends that listened to records and was awkward in, at the comic books and stuff like that. So me and Mick can transfer musical ideas quite easily to each other of w- what it is that we're like looking for. And playing with them is just a lot of fun. It's so hassle-free and uh, the audience. And it's intention live is nice, too, because it tends to have more of a... Uh, this is sound corny, but more of a joyous kind of celebratory kind of feel to it. Like it's a, more of a being alive uh, rather than, you know, like, uh, God, everything fucking sucks and blah, 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 you know, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's a, I always, you know, I feel good playing with them. I really yeah, like Mick. I like Mick Collins. You know, the Gories were a great band too. You surround yourself with like, you know, Matt Smith, Mick Collins, Jim Diamond. You know, these are really great musicians and they can make records and like you, like when you, your solo records, we haven't even got to that yet. You have eight solo records, I think, and a ninth one on the way, which is unbelievable. And on the last couple of records, you play all the instruments on the records, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And Xavier, uh, that's, I mean, there's no one around for that. I just did everything myself. So home recording changed things because especially when you're writing songs and, I'd go to quote demo it, you know, for the guys in the bands. But then I'm like, well, I like <laughs> I like what I played on the demo, and rather than forcing them to play exactly what I played, um, I'm like, okay, well, I'm saving that for me, you know, until you know, just just out of convenience, but it's enjoyable. It's so fun to hear what the little band in your head sounds like, you know. And uh, I felt I've compromised so much, and compromise is great, but in so many almost every other situation in the band, I've done some sort of compromise where I'm like, oh, I would have done that differently. So obviously with yourself and you're doing it, you got no one else to blame but yourself. And that's why probably Xavier is still my favorite album. I'm very pleased with it. Yeah, if, if anyone out there hasn't heard it, it's a double album, beautiful record. I mean, it looks great, sounds great. You play all the instruments, sing all the songs. It's a concept record basically, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. About a a, a woman that who has been um, a method actress since she was a child, which started started on a soap opera. So her first fourteen years of life, she was uh, method acting. And, and her mother played the mother too. It was a whole story. And her, she's a method actress too. But then the mother got a job doing a, a, a film version on the Peregrine, and so she thought she was a bird. <laughs> Well, I don't know how you come up with this stuff, dude. I got to tell you, man, oh. you really took me by surprise when you sent me that you uh, you were sending me advanced tracks of it, and I was listening to it, and it was like the songs were like all really long, and it you know Steve Hackett and Roxy Music and things like that would come into mind, and I'm thinking, right. wow, this is like so progressive, and you got a really good response, didn't you? Um, from very few people that heard it, yeah, the label did not send it out, didn't do any promo, nothing, absolutely nothing. So if anyone does know that record, it is, uh, it's uh, odd <laughs> to me. It's like a message in a bottle. Well, the, stuff, packet, but, but the but you, people have heard it's been nice. You know, if you can, if you're the artist and you get the label to do the packaging that you want, that's a really important aspect of it. And that packaging is just worth the price of the record alone. It's beautiful. That was the nice thing too, because I designed that and I've designed stuff before for the record stuff. And someone going, oh, we're going to change a little thing about it. And then I always get something that looked worse, like the first Witches record. They're like, oh, we're going to have our graphics guys. So I was thinking optimistic. Oh, he's going to do something cool. 
and it was horrible and it was nothing that I wanted. So this, I was very pleased because I, I designed that. I did the dice and the cover and, um, and, and so I laid that on and said, just exactly like this. So, and the only thing I had anyone really help me with is, um, Anthony Lanou, who plays with me in Super Birthday, uh, just helped me with the typeset and for the lyrics, just make it show it nice because he's a punk freak. Speaking, and stuff. So, but I'm glad you like the packaging. Yeah, and I'm I love glad it. that they made it up exactly how I wanted it. It's exactly how I wanted it. Yeah, my friend, uh, me. my good friend Alvin Long, who's also a Detroit guy like you, he, when I gave it to him and he checked it out, he was just like, oh my God, this thing is unbelievable. He was blown away by it because he's oh, like both of us. We like you know, early, early Genesis, Roxy Music, early King Crimson, you know, all that. I'm not, I don't never call myself a prog guy, but I do like the early progressive uh, metal bands, especially. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got, when I got into Genesis, I really got into them. I, I got to meet Phil Collins and Tony Banks, Mike Rutherford before, and I met Steve Hackett once too, like I was, was Guys that show up to show with the records for them to sign, you know, that type of thing. Nice. You, know, we, you know, I didn't backstage. And, and there's another guy to mention. I know you're a big fan of Getty Lee from Rush. Yeah, he's one of my favorite bass players. It's him and Chris Squire, uh, James Jamerson, Geezer Butler. And, but like some of Getty's playing, I just absolutely love his bass. Sound. I was trying to get him to produce me because I thought we could work with the producer. And I'm like, well, you know, I've got to think about him with, uh, about uh talk about vocal melodies i'm like well i need someone to keep on my case with melody and and i thought when well, no matter what record he does the bass always cuts through so nicely so i tried like mad to get in touch with him and i eventually he came around for his book and i went and i was going to hand him the album i brought an album to give him and i should have done that but i thought well he's traveling he probably doesn't want to travel the record so I gave it to the guy at the store. Instead, I gave him a little thumb drive with it, which I'm sure he lost or didn't listen to, or he listened to it and hated it. I don't know. And I tried to write him on the Instagram thing. I got a little done. I realized I'm becoming really obsessive, and I've got to stop. Well, actually, I don't know if you remember <laughs> this, but you got me with that obsession, and I reached out to Ray Daniels, Rush's manager, and I tried to get him on the phone. I got his oh, assistant, great. and he... She basically said, well, right now, Getty's too, working on his book, and he doesn't want it. They wouldn't even let me send them a copy of the record. And I was like, you yeah. won't even let me send you a copy? And I'm like, I said, it's a beautiful double album, and Troy loves Getty, and they wouldn't let <laughs> me send a copy of the album to them. I thought, I thought it was, uh, it, 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 kind of good this, uh, you know, he was all into stuff, you know, the British invasion stuff you know, Kings and Who and all that. And then he was into the prod stuff and then a lot of the new way stuff, like Debo or whatever thing. So I was going to say, yeah, something sounds like, uh, if you could take the British invasion, early seventies, Prague, late seventies and early eighties, punk and post punk, um, and mash that all together. That's a little bit what I want to do, <laughs> you know, but, uh, it didn't happen though. Okay. So, so I mean, the last thing okay, I want okay. to talk to you about is like uh, you. I know you got a new record coming out, and you mentioned to me there's a Beatles influence in your new unreleased music. Can you like elaborate on that a little bit? Well, the Beatles are the are just kind of in my DNA in a way. I mean, I, I mean that's a stupid as hell statement to make, but I mean, I, I it's uh, it's just that 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 was the first thing I really, really, really got into. Like three, four, and a band I never stopped disliking. And if anything, just got way into like you know reading the George Martin books and all little things, dissecting their songs. And uh, so the influence has always kind of been there. I mean, it has to have been there. It's just kind of been my kind of approach in I... a lot of ways because because and a lot of reasons too why I don't you know always get this. Oh, why don't you stick to a genre that you're playing? But I grew up with the Beatles, so in a lot of ways, and Bowie and the Stones, I thought a band had ballads, they had quirky songs, they had up-tempo songs, you know, they had getting your face tunes, they had beauty in it as well, and so I always thought it was so boring when I eventually started being in bands, and people, well, we're just this, we're just this, and I just, that was my template, so, and that's where I was coming from, again, so I didn't have, like, a peer group, I didn't have, like, one kind of thing I had to like, I just liked music, and it got obsessed with the radio at such an early age. Yeah, so the Beatles were always something there, you know, and uh, during this whole COVID kind of thing, I found myself listening to more 
again. And it's just, uh, I was just writing this stuff. And usually when I write, I'm like, oh, that's not a little bit too much like the Beatles. I shouldn't do that. And it's, then I'm like, well, you know, who cares? I don't care if this show is that. that. It's like, oh, you ripped them off. Fine. Okay, I don't I think did. anyone's going to say that. You have, you're the most <laughs> diversified musician I personally know. I mean, you can do any st- – come on, man. You're in prong and you're in the dirt bombs. I mean, give me – I mean, there's nothing in common about those bands whatsoever. And then all the other bands you played with. I, I think that you were due to, due to make a pop record, so I'm, like, excited to hear this. I was listening to it last night for the demos because I'm still, not demos. I'm in the recordings. They're not completely finished yet. And it's funny because I'm saying Beatles, but you might hear go, where the hell are you talking about? This sounds nothing <laughs> like them. You know, so it's, uh, it's, I was, uh, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be good. It's, uh, it's just been so difficult to do, you know, I'm working 40 hour week job. And then I was also working on the weekends, picking up bartending shifts and giving lessons too. And just so you only have a few hours to work on it. I'm doing it again myself. But um, it's re- it's uh, it's I'm very very I'm really excited. Me too. To, to be able for people to to be able to hear it. Do you have a and title yet? Tixo, T I I Q S O. That's the that's the working title. P I I Q X O. T I I Q S O, and it's actually enunciated. I made up the word. The way that's <laughs> enunciated is. <laughs> you know, like we're doing the sound of a laser. <laughs> you don't do anything normal at all. <laughs> it's nothing normal about you. That's why I love you, man. Um, mm. uh, well, you know, uh, I think we covered quite a bit. I mean, there's no way we could cover everything in one show. And I, I really talked about a lot of your stuff in the intro too, but um, I wish that you were, were a full time musician again. And I wish that's all you had Me to too. do. And Me uh, too. <laughs> I really do, man, because if there's anyone that I ever want to see, be able to just do music and make videos and films like you've done films too. You've done everything, dude. And, you know, I respect you. You're one of my favorite people, one of my favorite musicians, and I wish you nothing but the best of luck. And thank you for coming on the show. I'm sorry it took so long. I was actually oh. trying to get better for you. That's why I waited so long to invite oh, you I on. appreciate it. I feel like I'm just getting started. <laughs> I think really, it just takes like I'm just beginning. I think everything I've done up to now has just been, uh, just kind of helped me just let the artifice kind of go and just let it happen. I don't know. I feel like, you know, whatever. I mean, that's, I have personal feelings in a lot of ways that uh, kind of have an, I'm, I'm starting not just another chapter or a whole other book. And so I'm feeling good about it, though. Well, I'm yeah, looking so, forward yeah. to the next book, and I know a lot of other people are. So uh, Thank thanks, man, for coming on. And I'm sure that we'll be talking to each other soon, man. Fantastic. Thank you for having me. Steve. All right, Troy Gregory. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Okay, that was something. You know, when Troy and I talk, you know, just like we did in the interview, it's like we're on the phone. We always interrupt each other because we both like to talk. We have what I call Kim Fowley disease, and I've mentioned this before. It's the art of talking and not being able to ever stop talking. We both have that same disease. So if you put us together on the same phone call or conversation it's always going to be like that i'm really looking forward to the new record that troy has and the fact that he said when i asked him what it sounds like and he told me it sounds like the beatles i can't cannot wait (laughs) Uh, i want to give a shout out to baby loves tacos and my friends zach and john and the rest of the crew out in pittsburgh word has it they have a new location a third one opening soon in oakland uh which is amazing because the other two are fantastic. This one is right near the University of Pittsburgh, which is uh, located not far also from Carnegie Mellon University. It's one of my favorite areas to walk around in Pittsburgh. This is exciting news for everyone except for maybe Chipotle. (laughs) I'm sure they're not going to be happy when Baby Loves Tacos opens up in their neighborhood, but it's the way it goes. You know, I'm happy for Zach. He's done a great job, and he's been able to keep his business relevant through some tough 
tough times, which has been hard for many small businesses. And like I tell everyone, if you're in Pittsburgh, check out Baby Loves Tacos, where everybody eats, because it really is some fantastic food. Before I go, I also want to mention and thank people that have been writing me and reaching out to me about the show. I should do this more, but I've got a bunch of people here that I want to just thank for sending me messages, calling me and sending me emails or whatever. Heather Hopkins, Andrew Burns, Tom Wilson, who will be on the show in a couple weeks, Spooky, Craig Adams, Austin Rutledge, John Bianelli, who I'm also hoping to get on the show soon, the Reverend Hank Pierce, who's been on the show a couple times, always giving me feedback, LEV, who was on a couple weeks ago. Always great feedback. My old college buddy, Steve Peck, Allison Hell, who's one of my best friends, Chris Joachim, another good buddy, Jim McCarthy, Sweet Lou Mansdorf, Jeff Palmer, Debbie Rogers, James McAndrew. You know, that's just to mention a few. I want to thank you guys, man, for the support and the feedback because it means a lot. If you want to send me an email or reach out to me, twistedrico at gmail.com at Blowing Smoke with TR on Instagram, at Blowing Smoke BS on Twitter. And if you want to support this podcast, we have a Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Twisted Rico. We also have a YouTube page. Please like it and subscribe to it. A lot of our shows are up there in audio versions, and maybe one day they'll be in video again. It's only me that's keeping that from happening, but as soon as I... Start bugging our engineer at Voice Motel, Mr. Mike Nash, to get some video cameras set up. I'm sure we'll do the shows on video. Now that I've lost all this weight and I'm in better shape, I feel like I'll be the handsome guy again that I want. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about right now. Anyways, (laughs) thanks to Mike for recording this show. And please check out another podcast that I'm on called Seems to Me with Sibylle and Seriano, which is also recorded by Mike, and also available on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, Google, Breaker, etc., etc., etc. Till the next time we say goodbye, this is Blowing Smoke with Twisted Rico. I'm your host, Steve Ricardo. Keep the rock and roll alive and busy, Phillips. You know how much we love you. Hey.